Hey guys, Steven here. Question of the day, does God have a body or is he a spirit? Latter-day Saints understand that the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. The Father is God, the Christ is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, in that they all share in the same glory, but they are not each other. Yes, the Holy Ghost, also known as the Spirit of God, counts as being a part of God, even though he lacks a body. But you might ask how this thing could be, seeing as we need a body in order to be exalted to Godhood in the celestial kingdom. But that's just the thing, one doesn't need a body to be ordained to God. Christ was called God before he received a body. Obtaining a body is more about obtaining a fullness of joy than about obtaining Godhood. Christ as Jehovah was a spirit in the Old Testament times and received his body in the New Testament. It was he which Ammon identified as the Great Spirit, seeing as Ammon lived in a time in which Christ had not yet received his physical body. When we say spirit, we are not referring to some energy essence without shape or form, for indeed it does have shape and form. As long before Ammon, Christ showed his spirit body to Moriancomer the brother of Jared, after he had shown great faith and saw the finger of God. Christ said to him, Ye are redeemed from the fall, therefore ye are brought back into my presence, therefore I show myself unto you. Behold, I am he who was prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, I am the Father and the Son. In me shall all mankind have life, and that eternally even they who shall believe on my name, they shall become my sons and my daughters. And never have I shown myself unto man whom I have created, for never has man believed in me as thou hast. Seest thou that ye are created after mine own image? Yea, even all men were created in the beginning after mine own image. Behold this body which ye now behold is the body of my spirit. And man have I created after the body of my spirit, even as I appear unto thee to be in the spirit will I appear to my people in the flesh. John 4, 23-24 reads, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It looks to me here like Jesus is talking about the manner of worship. We worship the Father in spirit and truth. So what does Jesus mean by saying God is a spirit? He is referring to spirit as God, by whom we worship the Father. Notice when he says in spirit and in truth, spirit has a lowercase s, but when he says God is a spirit, spirit has an uppercase s referencing God the Spirit. Hence the phrase, God is a Spirit. For it is by God the Spirit that we worship God the Father. The phrase, God is a Spirit, truly can be a confusing one, which is why Joseph Smith felt the need to clear it up for us and translate it as, For unto such hath God promised his Spirit. Spirit again being capitalized. When we talk about God having a body, we are most often referring to God the Father having a body. After the death of the Apostles from the New Testament Church of Christ, the Church entered an apostasy and many doctrines were corrupted as a result. A major part of these corruptions had to do with Greek paganistic influences. And here come the Greeks, led out by their veteran centre-half, Heraclitus. Let's look at their team, as you'd expect, it's a much more defensive lineup. Plato's in goal, Socrates a front-runner there, and Aristotle as sweeper. Aristotle very much the man in form. As biblical scholar James Strong noted, towards the end of the first century and during the second, many learned men came over both from Judaism and paganism to Christianity. 
These brought with them into the Christian schools of theology their Platonic ideas and phraseology. Philosophers such as Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates marked the end of the Greek pantheon and the beginning of a new singular god who created all things, but was himself uncreated. However, they knew him not as an embodied being, but as a spirit essence. God was less of a person and more of an idea, a governing principle. According to these philosophers, God must be immaterial because immaterial was considered superior to physical matter, arguing that God must be immaterial because God does not change and neither does immaterial, saying that matter does change. However, these do not seem to stop to consider the possibility of eternal matter, which does not change and is of a higher dimension. But so it was. If paganism was conquered by Christianity, it is equally true that Christianity was corrupted by paganism, said historian Edward Gibbon. And so early Christians debated amongst themselves as to whether God had a body or not. The early Christian father Origen wrote, Jews indeed, but also some of our people, suppose that God should be understood as a man that is adorned with human members and human appearance, but the philosophers despise these stories as fabulous, informed in the likeness of poetic. Barry Bickmore, author of Restoring the Ancient Church, Joseph Smith, and Early Christianity, commented on Origen's quote, saying, The Jews and Christians who followed the standard Jewish interpretations believe that God had a body in human form. Why did Origen reject this? Simply because the philosophers thought it was silly. Greek converts to Christianity wanted to make their faith more appealing to people in their own culture, so they adopted a definition of God from the Greek philosophers, whose thought was widely respected at the time. The temptation was always there to make one's faith more popular by modernizing it. The Greek belief that God was more of a spirit essence flooded Christianity, and with it came the idea that the spirit was superior to the body, and that the body was a prison for the spirit. The tortured body of Christ became the ideal body, and some parts of Christianity took up the practice of self-flagellation, a practice which is about physically punishing the body, most often by whipping oneself in the back, a practice which is still happening today and was used by the Protestant reformer Martin Luther. So we see that the idea of God not having a body led to the idea that the body is bad, as God is supposed to be the ultimate ideal in the universe. The idea that he is just a spirit essence without shape or form which fills the immensity of space. As the Book of Common Prayer infamously teaches falsely that God is without body, parts, or passions. From this we learn that these three are inseparable. To lack a body is to lack parts, and to lack parts is to lack passions. By this, God cannot love you as he cannot be passionate about you because he lacks a body to give you a warm hug. That means he has no eyes he can't see. He has no ears he can't hear your prayers. He has no voice he can't speak his word to the prophets if that's the kind of a God. Some of them even say that he sat on the top of a topless throne. Now how absurd. To me, it seems to me that their description of the God that they believed in is about the best description of nothing that can be written. <laughs> Moses knew that that condition would prevail because when he went to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, he told them that they would not remain there long, but they would be scattered among the nations, and they would worship gods made by the hands of man, that is, man's doing, that could neither see nor hear nor taste their smell. That's exactly the kind of a God the whole Christian world were worshiping. But Moses didn't leave it at that. He said in the latter days, if they should seek after him, they should surely find him. If you were the devil and you wanted to take a hard-believing community of Christians and turn them into atheists without them knowing it, then all you must do is to turn their God that they claim to worship into nothing. Brilliant. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and keep it righteous, guys.